Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. Today I want to look at the magnetic field produced by the square loop right here. I've got a square loop, the length of the square is A, and I've got a current I going around that loop, and it's going around in the counterclockwise direction. What I want to do now is I want to apply the Biot-Savard law, which is just above my head here, and I want to integrate Right, integrate over the entire loop in order to find the total magnetic field produced by this square loop right here at its center. So what we're gonna first do is we're gonna first look at the general direction of the magnetic field right at the center and then we'll find what the magnitude is. I'm gonna try to use some symmetry in order to simplify some of the math. Now I'll show you how to do that. All right, let's get started. Okay, let's just first start by looking at the square loop here. So I have a length that is A, clearly which means that this distance here has to be A over two, and that's gonna be important later on when I kind of analyze this segment of wire. Look at the Biot-Savard law. So we have a couple terms here. Mu zero is simply a constant. Four pi is a constant. I is the magnitude of the current. And then you're left with this term here in the square bracket. Uh, DL is a vector that is going along the direction of the current. And I've illustrated one of those little vectors here, but again, I can go anywhere on that loop and define another vector DL. Here's another little vector DL. And what this does here is it's giving me the contribution to the magnetic field, this small magnetic field produced by this tiny element of current over here. Now the second term here is, there's a cross product here, so that's gonna be important. And also the last term here is the vector r. The vector r points from the element of current all the way to the point where I'm evaluating the field. So actually one thing that's important here is you can see that this vector r is always going to change, right? When the element dl is all the way down over here, right? the vector r is gonna point something like this. So the vector r constantly changes here as I, as I'm going to integrate over this wire and over all the four segments of this square. Well, one thing about this uh, square bracket term here, sometimes it's written in terms of a unit vector. So you'll sometimes see the square bracket here. Remember the unit vector, I can write it the exact same thing as a unit vector and divide in that case would only be the magnitude uh, squared. All right, these terms are the exact same thing. It just depends on how your book chooses to present it. All right, so now let's first look at the direction of the magnetic field using the right-hand rule. All right, so to find the direction of the magnetic field produced by any little segment of wire, all you have to do is use the right-hand rule. All right, right-hand rule gives you the direction of the magnetic field produced by that wire. Here I've got a circular wire, but you can apply the same rule to look at the square segment. Just look at each individual segment now separately, and you're gonna find the same direction for the magnetic field. So the right-hand rule basically goes like this. You take your thumb, and you put it in the direction of the current, right? So let's first examine kind of this guy right here, okay? I would take my thumb, put it in the direction of the current, and then you simply curl your fingers, right? And if you're interested in any point that's located inside the loop, like kind of down over here, you're gonna notice that your fingers should be pointing out of the loop. And you're gonna get that with the square loop as well, regardless of the segment that you're gonna choose. Take your thumb, put it in the direction of the current, and curl your fingers. Your fingers give you the direction of the magnetic field. Okay, pretty straightforward. So what we're gonna find for our loop here that's on the page is you're gonna find, if you use the right-hand rule, regardless of the segment that you pick, you're gonna find a magnetic field that's coming out of the page. And one more step that's gonna be important here is we're gonna use a little bit of symmetry to simplify the problem as much as we possibly can. So let's first compare this guy over here. All right, this is going to be a small segment DL that has a current I flowing through it. But what if I went in the cube and I kind of drew it over here, right? What if I draw another segment DL pointing over here and it kind of makes the same angle as this one. This might be an angle phi. And now I would have a distance or a vector r that goes from the center of that element all the way down over here. Now the vector is different in this case, but have a look at it. It's the same distance as this one, right? And actually every time I have a different segment dl on this wire, the lower wire over here, I have another one over here that I can calculate. Basically what I want to get to is actually I can break this down into four problems, right? There's kind of four different wires. Let me call this one one two, three, and four. And if I wanna find the total magnetic field at the center, the total magnetic field is gonna be the magnetic field due to wire one, plus the magnetic field due to wire two, plus three, and plus four. 
However, just due to the symmetry of the problem, right, this little segment of wire is going to produce the same field as this segment of wire over here. And actually the total wire over here is going to produce the same field as wire one down below. And it's going to produce the same magnetic field as wire three. The right hand rule can, should convince you that it's going to be in the same direction. And since everything is completely symmetric, all of these guys have to be the same contribution. So B total is simply four times the field, for example, produced by wire one. So we're gonna use this fact here just to simplify the calculation. There is no need to integrate over four different wires. All you have to do is just find the field produced by one wire at the center and then multiply it by four to get the total magnetic field. Now this would not be true if I wanted to calculate the field, for example, at a point that is not at the center. Right? In that case, all of these different segments are different distances away from that point. So in that case, I would have to do the full calculation. But in this case, uh, since I'm right at the center of a square, this simplification is really going to help us out here. So I'm first going to focus on this wire one over here. We're going to find the field produced by this total wire one down over here. So let's apply the B.O. Savard in order to find that. So let me put a little bit of one over here. And now what we have to do here, don't worry about the constant terms, those are simple. All we have to do now is to define at least both of those vectors over here, and then we're gonna have to integrate this expression. But let's start by defining both of those vectors. Uh, first is the vector DL, and DL kind of goes like this, right? It's a small vector that goes in the direction of the current. In this case here, DL, this one's pretty straightforward, right? DL is simply, right, each segment of wire here is going along the X direction. So the magnitude of DL is gonna be a tiny length of that wire, which is DX, and the direction here is simply going to be along the X direction. We call that the I hat direction like this. And notice I have it going in the positive direction because the current is flowing uh, from left to right. All right, the next one here is the vector R prime. Okay. R prime is shown over here and it's a vector at least for this little segment that's pointing kind of in this direction over here. Okay. In order to simplify this a little bit, this is what I'm going to do. Let's actually break R prime down into two components, right? R prime here has a component like this and then it also has a component kind of going up. And this should make my life a little bit easier. Now the other thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to define an angle phi. I'll define that angle right here and you'll see why in a minute. And now let's not forget that um, the square here has a length A, so that means that at least this distance right here, if I go all the way down, this here has to be A over two. Now this will help you a little bit. Now if we write down some uh, trigonometric terms over here, uh, one thing I can do is write sine and cosine of this angle. So let me go ahead and do this. So sine of the angle phi, and you'll see why in a minute, it's gonna be pretty straightforward. So this here is gonna be some distance X, so if I write sine of phi, it's simply x divided by the length of r. So that's easy. So r prime, and that means that cos of the angle, uh, cos of the angle here would be, uh, this length is a over two. And that there has to also be divided by the magnitude of that vector r prime. Okay, so I'm gonna use kind of both of these here to help me define this vector. So right away now, I should be able to write that the vector r prime, which goes into my Bio Savard law, is going to have an x component. That's the this vector over here, the purple one. And look at that here, at least for this little segment, that vector points in the negative x direction. So let's make sure we have this. And then it also has a component that points along the y direction. So it's also gonna have one of these. Okay, now what is this? x vector, well, it's this value x, which I have over here. And the value x is simply sine of the angle phi multiplied by the length of r. So let me write that down. So the way I have it here is r prime multiplied by sine of the angle phi. And notice I have the right direction here because I have a negative sign in here for the i hat term. Plus, now this term here should be a positive component because it's pointing upward using the cos relationship, I can write that as either a over two, because that's the length of this, uh, this vector over here, but I'll write it in terms of the angle phi just to keep it kind of uh, similar to the first term. So here I would simply write it as r prime and cos of 
the angle phi. And again, just to reiterate here that this term right here is nothing more than a over two. That's the length of that other vector. Okay, so let me just clean this up a little bit. Just write it kind of nice. Uh, the vector r prime, I'll take the negative sign out. Again, we're gonna have the magnitude of that distance multiplied by sine of the angle phi. And plus, again, the magnitude of the distance multiplied by cos of the angle phi. All right, we've got both vectors defined now, right? We've got our element dl, and now we have the vector r. All we have to do now is simply go back and substitute things in the Biot-Savart and then add up all the different contributions, which means integrate. Let's go do that. So we substitute now our expressions in the Biot-Savart. We're gonna focus now on this first on the numerator term. We need to evaluate that cross product uh, the cross product now is dl, which we have over here. So let me go ahead and write this. Uh, dl cross with the vector r prime. Again, dl, I'm just going to now substitute the values. And that is a cross product. Let me make that in red just so we can kind of see it better. And now cross product with everything here in the bracket, right? So this is minus r prime sine of phi i hat and plus r prime and cos of phi. And that's in the j hat direction. All right, now the cross product, the first two terms here again, if you look at these, let's change the color over here. We have a term that's going to be a vector i, a cross product with a vector i. Now you should remember a few relationships, right? This here has to be equal to zero. What else? j cross with a vector j also equals to zero. And another one that's kind of useful for this one, I cross with the letter J gives me the vector K, right? That's in the Z direction. And that's what we said using the right-hand rule. And we're going to see. So we don't have to worry about this first term when you multiply both of these first terms. You get zero for that. However, for the second term now, you will have something. So the vector DL cross with the vector R prime is going to be equal. So DX will remain. That's just the length. Uh, the next term, again, the magnitude is going to be there. So it's the vector r prime, the length of it, cos of the angle phi. And then you're left with this guy with a cross product with j hat. And that we just said equals to k hat. That's the z direction. And we already know that from the right-hand rule. So there we go. All we have to do now is just substitute this into our Biot-Savart in the numerator over here. We'll make some simplifications and then we'll integrate and then that'll be it. We'll get our final answer. At least for wire one, then we'll simply multiply the answer by four to get the total field. Substituted the expression up here. Now there's one simplification we can make here. Here we have the magnitude of R, which is one time. We have it three times over here, so I can write it like this. All right, so now we've got kind of three terms over here that kind of all depend on each other, right? We have x or dx, we have the angle phi, and we also have r prime, right? And all of these are kind of dependent on each other, and you could see that from my trigonometric expressions right here, right? The angle theta depends on x, depends on r prime, and so forth. So what we have to do here is we have to simplify that. Um, we're going to use something called trigonometric substitution over here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write an expression. I have sine and cos. I don't have tangent. I'm going to go ahead and do that one. This is tangent of the angle phi. And that means I just have to divide the sine by the cos. You notice here that the r primes are going to cancel out. And that's going to help me. Here I'm going to have x and divided by a over 2. All right, now what I want to do is let me bring the a over 2 kind of upstairs over here just to kind of keep this expression Kind of nicer over here. Let's go a over two. All right, now what happens if I differentiate dx with respect to d phi? Because I wanna get rid of my dx over here in my field expression. So if I do that, okay, if I kind of write this expression, dx divided by d phi, that means I have to take the derivative of a tangent, okay? And that's something you should check out for yourself. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that. That one is pretty straightforward. It's cos squared of the same angle. And that is dx over d phi. So that means that my dx I can replace here in this expression. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to rewrite the element of field. I have still all my constant terms remaining. 
All right, now we're gonna start substituting some terms. So dx, again, I'm gonna use this expression here. dx is going to be uh, a over two. Put that one there. What else? Uh, divided by cos squared of the angle phi. And I also have the element d phi now. Okay, so I've got dx here. I still have this term over here. That's cos of the angle phi. And now I have to do something about this r squared. And this is still cos. Okay, r squared, if you have a look at it, actually, let's have a look at this guy right here. Right? r squared, I can also write in terms of the angle. Right? You simply swap both of those. You should be able to see that the length r, I can write as a over 2, divided by cos of the angle. So again, my goal is always to write this whole thing in terms of one variable. So here, I'm going to have it squared, so I can't forget that. So I'm going to have a over 2 squared and divided by cos squared of phi. I could have probably written that a little bit better, but uh, this is what it looks like. So now you simply simplify some of the terms. You have cos squared here. I have cos squared here. I have a over 2 here. I can get rid of one of those here. And I don't have many terms left, so let's write that final element of magnetic field produced by this little bit of current. All the constant terms are in the front. The only thing really left here, so I have 1 divided by, I'm just going to keep it as a over 2 here. And that's simply half the distance of uh, the length of the square. And here I have cos of phi multiplied by the small element d phi. And all of this always ends up being in the z direction. So all we have to do now is integrate this expression. You notice it's only in terms of one variable. And that's the variable phi, and that's important. That makes the integration a lot easier. All right, so let's go to the next page, finish this off. My goal was to get the total field from wire one. This is the field produced by a tiny little element in wire one. So to get the total field from wire one, all I need to do is add up all of those elements. Pretty straightforward. There's all of these constant terms over here. I don't have to worry about any of those. That's mu zero, i divided by four pi, <laughs> a over two. And now here I have to integrate the function cos of phi d phi. Now think about the limits that we have to integrate over. Okay, uh, The angle phi will range, right? The wire extends from here and goes all the way over here. Okay, This angle here, that's we're going to call this minus phi max. And it's symmetric, right? If it's a square... This here is the final angle, which is going to be phi max. So let's put those limits of integration in there. All the way to phi max. Those are the limits of integration. Now, this is very, very straightforward. The field due to wire one. Last time I write these constant terms over again, hopefully. For pi, a over two. All right, the integration of a cos gives me sine of the angle. And again, I have to evaluate that between both of these limits. All right, this is easy. So we're left with mu zero i. Man, I should have cut and pasted all of this. <laughs> all right, now that we have a square bracket, we have sine of phi max minus sine of negative phi max. Now, if you know some of the properties of the sine, sine of a negative angle basically just gives me minus of that angle. <laughs> so at the end, let's write the final expression kind of down here below wire one. Uh, below wire one, what we have here is mu zero i four pi a over two. And this term here ends up being the same, right? So we end up getting two times sine of phi max. All right, let's put it all together now and find the total field produced by the complete square. Here was our expression for wire one. Again, this was written in terms of this maximum angle. And for a square loop, have a look, the maximum angle for a square, this will extend all the way to 45 degrees. It won't go any further. Now remember that the sine of 45 degrees is equal to square root of 2 over 2. So you can get rid of this expression over here. Just simplify this. 
punch in route two over two. And remember, at the end, their goal was to get from the square loop, right? From the square loop. And that was four times the field produced by one segment of wire. And all of this was in the K hat direction. We still have that. So let's simply carry this out now. The last expression of the square loop is going to be four times uh, this whole term. Actually, let's write it out. Mu zero I four pi A over two. This becomes two and sine of theta max is square root of two over two. All right, cancel out a whole bunch of terms here. This two can cancel out with that one. Uh, this four can cancel out with this four. And I'll write it down over here, the B of the square loop, always in the K hat direction. All the segments produce a field in the same direction. So the first term here I'm gonna write out is root two divided by pi. What else? I had mu zero, the current, and divided by A over two in the K hat direction. All right, folks, there it is. That's the final expression for uh, the field produced by the square loop. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments section. I'll get back to you. Hopefully you understood this derivation. I tried to include all the steps uh, so it's easy to follow. All right, thanks for watching, folks.